morning and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. It's Monday, March 29th, 2021. And on this episode, I'm talking about the latest efforts to ramp up federal gun control. This time they're using bump stock Trump's approach. And the current gun grabber in chief and the ATF are looking at ways to redefine a word like the word firearm. So so-called ghost guns, which is really kind of a term of propaganda in my mind, uh, because it gives an impression that they don't exist or they're totally hidden, uh, can somehow come under the Gun Control Act of 1968. So they just want to redefine the term of something of a part and turn that part into a firearm through executive order, maybe through legislation. We'll see. So I've got some info on this episode on a meeting that the ATF had with some major manufacturers just last week. I've got uh, an overview of some of the related federal gun control laws already on the books. Of course, we take the position here that the only well, the number of federal gun control measures that are authorized by the Constitution is zero. But let's take a look at what's going on and see how it all ties in. And then I do have some thoughts and I'm citing an article over at Reason and then also uh, going to be talking a little bit about 3D printing as well on whether or not this type of thing is even going to be enforceable if they end up being able to pull it off. That doesn't mean it's okay, but we have to think about that strategically. But first of all, before getting to that, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. Our show homepage is 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. It's all spelled out, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. And there you're going to follow, find everything you need to follow the program, all the archives for over two and a half years, individual episodes like this one today. I publish a new post for each individual episode about anywhere from a half hour to a couple hours after the live broadcast is done. And I include a bunch of links that I'm referencing. When I read through pieces of articles or other information, I will link to that in the show notes so you can read and learn more in context on your own time because I'm just scratching the surface. Of course, we have all the different platforms that we're on because just in case we're not on one of those mainstream live streaming ones like Facebook, uh, Twitch, Twitter, or YouTube, you know that there we are elsewhere like Odyssey, Gab TV, Minds.com, sometimes on MeWe. They have file size limitations for the archives, uh, Library.tv, and elsewhere. Plus, we're also on the podcast editions, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, even Amazon, which I can't stand. It is a company, but man, sometimes you just got to use what you got to use. Anyways, all of those platforms and all of even our membership program where you can support us financially for as little as two bucks a month is over at 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty. And while we allow people another uh, few moments to get notifications to join us in the live stream, I want to thank a couple of people who did join us as members recently, just a handful that I grabbed here at random. David in Arizona, Jane in Florida, Lainey or Lonnie in Florida, Bruce in Ohio, Lezek in Illinois, and Maureen in Ohio as well. I can't thank you enough for putting your fin financial faith behind our work and all the members out there that I do see joining us in the chat. Thank you. There's no way we could roll up our sleeves every single day in support of the Constitution and Liberty without your support. And I do have two quick programming notes as well. Last week, Friday, I was not able to do the live stream. I was too busy. And this on Thursday, the day I have to prep, I will probably be doing my live stream again on Saturday. Fast Friday edition will probably be on Saturday. On Thursday, I'm going over to the west side of town, Culver City, to Reason Magazine headquarters, at least scheduled as of now, to talk about Second Amendment Preservation Acts in the states. I'm glad that they're giving it some attention. And then all also, if you live in Missouri, I did this episode on Saturday that you should check out, but it wasn't specifically about Missouri. Mike Meharry has an incredible article that we are publishing today. Uh, we just got to give it a final editorial review. We're publishing today about proposed amendments to the Missouri Second Amendment Preservation Act, which already passed by a huge margin out of the House, like 107 to 40 something. House Bill 85. This bill is uh, is set to ban enforcement or foundation to ban enforcement of all federal gun control past, present, and future. It, there probably is going to be some nitty gritty once we see it how, it how it plays out, but it really is a huge step forward to protect the Second Amendment in Missouri. But the Missouri Sheriff's Association is the number one organization. You would expect the Bloombergs of the world or the every towns of the world to be aggressively lobbying against this bill. They don't need to waste their money there. They can spend it on implementing a ghost gun uh, 
uh, registration or a tracking or background check screen uh, scheme or maybe even a ban on it sometime in the future. Like they already have a ban on 3D printed or undetectable firearms that we're going to talk about later in this episode as well. But the Missouri Sheriff's Association is proposing amendments in the state Senate once it already passed the House that will... I mean, these people are scammers. They are using really tricky legal arguments, and we've gone through each step by step by step to show how not only does it not make it a Second Amendment Preservation Act, but it is a political cover. So the Missouri sheriffs, which we don't know if the individuals are on board or not on this, but the Missouri Sheriff's Association is aggressively lobbying against this bill and trying to turn it into something that will protect the president's ability to continue federal gun control and enforce whatever new garbage they have coming down the pike. Anyways, uh, quick hello to everyone in the live chat. I see Irwin and Daniel and Josh for Liberty, Blue North Wind, Patricia, Terry, uh, Dan, Justin, Joe, Larry, Melissa, MRGF, and everyone else. I'm just going to go through that quickly because we're running a little, little bit long here in the intro, and I will see if I can look at some questions and comments a little bit later. I appreciate you spending some time with me today. Let's get right to this, and I want to start out with the Wall Street Journal. I will link to this in the show notes, I had to sign up for a free trial to their uh, subscription service because it's behind a paywall. There are other reports on this if it turns out you run into that, uh, but it is uh, really good information. So here's how they started out. Federal firearms, this was uh, published actually just, I guess it was on Friday on the 26th. Federal firearms regulators m met with gun industry representatives on Friday to discuss weapons that can be made from parts purchased online, a signal the Biden administration may tackle the proliferation of weapons known as ghost guns. Ghosts are scary, right? scary, right? And you may get a kick out of the title of this episode. We ain't afraid of no ghosts, even if the ATF wants us to be. You can call it whatever the hell you want. But the Second Amendment doesn't say shall not be infringed unless someone makes it from parts that don't have serial numbers that are traceable by the federal government. That's a side note, but it's an important one to point out as well. Going back to the Wall Street Journal, this is from Zusha Ellenson. The discussion led by officials from the BATFE, which shouldn't exist, it should, or it should just be a commercial store, and firearms manufacturers focused on a possible expansion of the definition of what counts as a firearm, according to people who participated. Such a move could subject ghost guns to the same regulations as other firearms. The reason that I pointed out that this is bump stock, Trump's approach, and he's not the only one. Uh, the previous administration thought about doing the same thing with bump stocks. Basically, what they did was they took this accessory and then they said, no, 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 this is a machine gun. And you, if you're following the court case on this, there was some recent good news on that. I'm not holding out ho hope for the courts to do the right thing, but people have already been affected by this for now three years almost, because this was from 2018. We're going on three years, and if you're waiting on the courts, why should people have to give up their liberty for three years or be in fear of prosecution by an illegal, unconstitutional agency like the ATF or the local police who do the bidding of the ATF, M Missouri Sheriff's Association, I'm looking at you. Um, but why should people have to live like that? Instead, we should be rejecting this at its outset. The best time to reject, resist, and nullify federal gun control measures are the moment they happen. The second best time is today. Anyway, so this is what's, there was this meeting, this is what's happening, and here's a little bit more. Uh, going further from Wall Street Journal, on Monday, uh, 18, this is last week Monday, 18 Democratic state attorneys general sent a letter to Attorney General Merrick Garland urging him to ask, act on ghost guns. This has been kind of an ongoing thing, pushing ghost guns. I'll talk about what those are in a minute. Earlier this month, four Democratic senators sent a letter to the president asking him to direct the ATF to regulate these firearms under the Gun Control Act and ensure that they are subject to a background check. They are not currently subject to a background check because they are not firearms. They are parts. And the Gun Control Act specifically addresses that. Here from Wikipedia, they talk about some of the relevant federal legislation. This is on their so-called ghost gun page. Again, it's a term of art, term of propaganda, but let's just use it because that's what everyone talks about, and maybe we can correct it as we go. They say Congress passed the Gun Control Act of 1968, or the GCA, to expand interstate commerce controls over common firearms like pistols, revolvers, shotguns, and rifles shouldn't exist. 
but it's there. The GCA requires those who are, quote, engaged in the business. And that's, I like that they actually include that because specifically, let's say we set aside the fact that the Gun Control Act shouldn't be there. It's unauthorized by the Constitution. It is there. Let's set aside the fact that it shouldn't be there. It does specifically say that it is addressing those who are engaged in the business of manufacturing or dealing in firearms. They have to be licensed by the ATF. But of course, we should also point out that once you give these type of people, and I, when I say these type of people, I mean people in government, politicians, bureaucrats, their supporters, federal agents, law enforcement, whatever. As soon as you give them an inch, th over time, they will always expand, expand, expand. As John Adams once put it, he said, encroachment on the Constitution is like a cancer. And it eats and eats, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you're just basically dead. John Dickinson warned us of the same thing, because soon as they get a foot in the door, what changes the ability of a pr people to be considered a free people is not that government is just deciding to not attack your liberty right now. It's just that they're so restricted from doing so that they're not able to. That's what makes a free people. But as soon as you give them the ability to do one thing, they will use that as a floor and expand on it over time. And it may be decades later, it may be a century later. The fact of the matter is, as soon as you give them an inch, they take a thousand miles uh, in the long run. So they pass this Gun Control Act, and they specifically say this is for people engaged in the business of it. They also go on. They say to help enforce these pro prohibitions, Congress passed the Brady Act, also shouldn't exist in 1993 creating the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, or NICS. I mean, I'm reading um, the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, and I didn't notice that it says unless the federal government determines that you're not authorized to have the right to keep and bear arms anymore. I don't see that at all. Anyways, they required FFLs to submit potential firearms purchaser information to NICS before transferring firearms. While Congress passed the GCA, they write, to help law enforcement fight gun crime, it expressly added, I, that, I'm sorry I even read that, but it's there, it expressly added that the act was not in to place any undue burden on law-abiding citizens who use or make firearms for lawful private purposes. This is for firearms dealers. And so what the problem that they're having now in trying to, they've created this act, the problem that they're currently having to enact more gun control is they're saying, well, this hasn't been defined as a firearm, and this is for personal, not commercial sales. So people are buying parts online or buying some of the parts, and then they're buying other parts at, uh, you know, your local uh, department or your local office supply or <laughs> home supply store, office supply, maybe home office supply, I'm not sure. But you're buying more parts and you're finishing it. You're building it. You're the manufacturer. And if you're not selling it, you're not engaged in the, the sale and you don't need a license to do this. And so therefore you don't need this background check. So uh, the background check and the whole program is the problem. It gives them the foot in the door. But we can also recognize the language doesn't authorize this. We also have to recognize that so sooner or later they're going to try to redefine those terms. Just like the Trump administration uh, ordered the president himself at the time. He specifically ordered the ATF to do this on bump stocks. And once you give them that type of footing, they're going to try to do it. And if the supposed Second Amendment president does that exact same approach, why should we be surprised when this guy does the exact same thing? Here from every town. They talk about this is what they've been pushing for. And these people are awful. They say, one, ATF should adopt a new definition of firearms, firearm frames and receivers, specifically in quotes, firearm frame and receivers. Just have a new definition. But if you've heard me talk about how to read a legal document over time, really, you have to recognize that like any legal document, the words of that document mean the same today as it did the moment it was given legal force. Because, for example, if you signed a deal with your landlord that says you're going to pay $2,000 a month rent, and then they redefine that $2,000 to really mean $3,000, or, you know, you can have a search out. All of a sudden, they just start tacking things out. This would be a very bad version of life for almost all people. But the fact of the matter is, the federal government does this 
and gets away with it all the time. And the ATF is one of the worst offenders. I'm sure the DEA is really bad on this as well, and they shouldn't exist either. But the ATF has done this in the past. We know just in the last administration, and now every town is using that approach to try to push the ATF to just take the definition of firearm frame and receivers and turn it into firearm. Now that's a firearm, and then it can be uh, caught up under the Gun Control Act of 1968. So then Congress doesn't even have to pass anything. This is how they just do this by executive fiat. They always claim that they're doing it under statutory authority, and the, the Supreme Court has never struck this down, so it must be constitutional. We're supposed to assume that as well. And then number two, they say if ATF fails to act, then Congress should enact legislation to overrule ATF's interpretation and clarify that, quote, unfinished frames and receivers are firearms, prohibit the manufacture, sale, transfer, purchase, and possession of a gun without a serial number, and require ATF to collect data and publicly report on the availability and recovery of ghost guns. Wow, no joke. Here from CNN, they're pointing out last week, okay, they're gonna, they want to take this approach. They're going to look, they're looking at this recommendation number one from every town and basically every other gun grabbing group out there. That is just redefine a word so now we can fit it under the law that exists on the books. And I put law in quotes there when I'm thinking it and saying it because it really shouldn't exist. So here from CNN, Kevin Liptock and Megan Vasquez, the executive actions that could be coming. And I think the administration has specifically said, well, we'd rather have Congress do this. Uh, but if we have to, so maybe they're switching two and one around. I don't know. But the uh, every town people really want it to be number one is just executive fiat. These executive ac action CNN reports could include requiring background checks on sales of so-called ghost guns and other measures Biden administration officials tell CNN. And of course, this guy, what's his name? Cedric Richmond. Cedric Richmond, who is the Office of Public Engagement Director, says this, all of our executive orders, we're very careful to make sure that they're constitutional and they're legal. Our team will look at the options and put all the options on the table to pr for the president to decide where he wants to go. So where's it supposed to say, OK, well, they've told us they're the experts. We've got the lawyers and the legal team telling us what our Constitution is supposed to mean. And, you know, they're going to define the limits of their own power. And no one should be surprised that if you rely on federal politicians or the federal government in any way, including the federal courts, to tell the people of the several states how much power that the federal government itself has, has, you should never be surprised when that power continues to grow and grow and grow, no matter which team is in charge in Washington, D.C. Now, we also have to point out that the ATF hasn't been waiting for the executive action on this. Here from NRA ILA, last December, they already started taking action. There's some uh, claims that there was collusion and meeting with the incoming administration. And here's how they put it at NRA. On December 10th, agents from the BATFE raided Dayton, uh, Nevada-based Polymer 80. A lot of you might be familiar with that company. The company manufactures unfinished, often referred to as 80% receivers and frames. There are also reports of BATFE confronting Polymer 80 customers and confiscating certain unfinished frame kits. I haven't verified that independently, and this was just as it was happening, so we don't, I, maybe someone else knows. You can leave a comment in the comment section and let me know if you've got any more info on this. The move marks the first direct assault on unfinished frames and receivers since the news broke in November of collusion between BATFE and Biden's transition team to target these items by executive fiat. And that's the approach that they're taking. Uh, that's the approach that they took on the bump stock ban. And that's the approach we should expect more and more and more. But let's keep in mind, if we're talking about the relevant federal legislation that they're trying to kind of shoehorn these 80 percent receivers and frames into, the Gun Control Act and the Nix system and the Brady Act. Well, how can <laughs> I have a real hard time with the NRA because they're one of the most effective gun control organizations in history. Basically, everything that's on the book and books in Washington, D.C. got some kind of support or concession from the NRA here, for example, the Nix system. Again, the Second Amendment does not say that the federal government is authorized to do a background check and prevent people from having the right to keep and bear arms based on a federal background check, period. But here's the NRA specifically pointing out that the NICS, the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, 
was the legislation that the NRA supported at its very inception as, and has consistently supported since. Well, geez, what a surprise. You guys have supported this background check system, which shouldn't exist in the first place, as a way to show that we're all just law-abiding. No one's trying to harm anybody. I don't know. Or maybe you're just bad. I don't know what the motivation is. But it's pretty awful that you've been on board with this all along. And now you're complaining when politicians do what politicians do, which is try to put anything and everything into that background check system and ruin it for everybody. Here, the, N the Knicks, this is again from NRA ILA, set up by the permanent provisions of the Brady Act. Again, Brady Act, Knicks system. I'm not sure where NRA was on the Gun Control Act of 1968. They certainly got the, the National Firearms Act of 34 passed. They probably did of 1938, but the Gun Control Act of 68 really kind of overturned 38 and expanded on it. Anyway, so the Knicks system from the NRA, set up by the permanent provisions of the Brady Act, which frankly should have been called the NRA Act. Wow, I forgot that they said that. I have this highlighted from a previous episode I did a couple of years ago on it. So NRA themselves says that the Brady Act should have been called the NRA Act, is run by the FBI, and it is constitutional because Congress has the power to tell federal employees what to do. Oh, okay, that's that's the limit. If that's the limitation of federal power, there is no limit on federal power. Period. This is awful stuff. Anyways, I wanted to remind everybody that's the situation. Now, here's some good stuff from BearingArms.com. They're talking about the Wall Street Journal report. I will link to this as well. The blog is pretty interesting. They say the Wall Street Journal points out that six states have already passed laws regulating or banning the sale of unfinished frames or receivers, but notes that enforcement has been difficult. That's a positive thing in my mind. Enforcement is difficult. In California, here, for example, anyone building a gun on their own is supposed to register it and get a serial number for the firearm. Between July of 2018 and January of 2020, over a year and a half period, the state issued serial numbers for about 3,300 home-built firearms. But authorities have no way of knowing how many others might be out there. Wink, wink, hint, hint. Maybe there's 33,000 or 300,000. Maybe there's 100. And all of us here in California, a bunch of compliant, uh, boot-licking clowns. I don't know. That won't change, they say. Even if the ATF were to require background check, on the sales of all unfinished frames and receivers. It's now not only possible, again, from Bearing Arms, who wrote this? Uh, I think this is, oh, right from Cam Edwards. A lot of you should know Cam Edwards and his YouTube channel and podcast and all that stuff. That won't change, even if the ATF were to require background checks on the sales of all unfinished frames and receivers. It's now not only possible, says Cam, but pretty easy to use a 3D printer to build a firearm from scratch without having to purchase anything other than the raw material and the printer itself. And that leads me to this article uh, from Reason Magazine by JC JD to Seal back in February. And this article is basically pointing out that even if they do this ghost gun ban, right, just like what Cam was saying in Bearing Arms, how are they going to be able to enforce this? Because people are finding more and more. Just like kind of the cryptocurrency people are looking for ways outside the Federal Reserve System, these are ways to get around the government-controlled system by making it at home, controlling your own destiny. destiny. Not being your own bank, but being your own firearms manufacturer. I would love to learn how to do this. I'm pretty incompetent, but maybe at some point. I, I think it's going to be a necessary kind of life skill to learn this. They say it's hard to imagine stopping it short of banning 3D printers or metal pipes. Can you imagine the amount of stuff they would have to ban at a Home Depot or a Lowe's in order to stop people from making and drilling and all this stuff? This is what Slate's Ari Schneider observed recently of the FGC-9, a semi-automatic weapon that's the latest brainstorm of DIY gun enthusiasts. Most of the gun is 3D printed, he says, while the rest includes inconspicuous parts available at hardware stores. That's what I was trying to think of when I was saying office supply stores. Here again from JD, he says, placing tighter restrictions on 80% receivers or other precursor parts for firearms is the equivalent of the old Soviet regime trying to shut down the underground 
Sami's dot. So this is kind of outside of state control, the underground press by regulating copiers. I didn't realize that this was a thing, but I'm unsurprised. So the Soviet press said you couldn't, the Soviet uh, regime said you couldn't print certain things. And so people had these underground printing presses. This is kind of like uh, the more they regulate the clear web, the interwebs that we're familiar with, the more that people will go to the dark web that is decentralized as that's being built as well. So it was an inconvenience once they regulated copiers, but the publishing network worked around the restrictions. And the reason I'm mentioning this, of course, is 3D printers. And there's a guy that I follow on Twitter that does makes does a lot of cool stuff, fun stuff, makes you think. Uh, a lot of funny memes and things like that regarding government power but also runs a, a website called 3D Printer Go Burr. And for those of you uh, who know what the Go Burr is, it's kind of a reference to Federal Reserve printing notes, but they're destroying the economy. But you can destroy gun control the more that people are making their own firearms. So I just wanted to pull that website up so you guys were aware of it and maybe can read about it and learn a little bit more. Anyways, back over to um, every town. This is just a little clarification. They don't think everything is a ghost gun. And so in their report, and so we look at every town because we understand that they're kind of the leading talking point, the leading legal arguments for doing more stuff. So they take the position that some things are considered ghost guns and th some things are considered something else. Here, for example, downloadable guns, they say, are one type of ghost gun and are created with computer code instructions programmed into a 3D printer. 3D printed guns do not have serial numbers and the code and 3D printer can be acquired without a background check. Can you imagine this is what's going to happen? So if they're talking about this, code and 3D printer can be acquired without a background check. So in other words, in order to make certain purchases, you may have to, you should not be surprised that in order to purchase certain equipment, drills, printers, you may have to have a background check. And that means the government is going to be more involved in every transaction that happens. If you need a, um, a background check in order to download code, that means in websites, they're going to have to build access that actually transmits the information directly to the federal government to give you purchase before you can access a download. And once you do that, you've basically ruined the entire internet and it's pretty close to that already. And that's why I also mentioned the dark web because they can't do that on the dark web. It's not really up to snuff to running whatever kind of website you want. There's all kinds of crazy stuff on there, but I think more and more people are going to slip away to decentralized or dark uh, websites because this type of thing. Anyway, so downloadable guns, they want to see, I think they want to see uh, regulated, banned, stopped, controlled. Of course, they want everything controlled. They're also talking about undetectable guns. They say, well, they're maybe considered ghost guns. And this is how every town puts it. Undetectable guns are firearms that cannot be detected by metal detectors or x-ray machines. Downloadable guns, because they are typically made with polymer, are undetectable with metal detectors unless a piece of metal is inserted into them. And some of the 3D uh, designs do include a piece of metal on purpose. I don't think they always have to from what I've read. Other people would know this way better than I do. I am not the expert on that at all. I just read some stuff and get more information and blab it back to you guys. But from my understanding, there are a lot of 3D printed plans that do include a piece of metal, so they're not considered undetectable. Why? Because current federal law prohibits the manufacture, sale, and possession of undetectable guns. I was aware of federal gun laws like 34 and 68 and 86 and 2018 for a long time, but I only learned in the last few years about the Undetectable Firearms Act of 1988. And here, back to NRA. This was from a few years ago, uh, written by, I have no idea who wrote this one, Chris Cox. Well, it was it's a press release, but it's quoting Chris Cox from NRA ILA. They say, regardless of what a person may be able to publish on the internet, undetectable plastic guns have been illegal for 30 years. Undetectable Firearms Act of 1988. So I guess my government school math is not that good. I would guess this was published around 2018. They say federal law passed in 1988 crafted with the NRA support. And I don't mean this just to be a slam on the NRA. It's also to point out that if you're making an undetectable firearm, you can thank the NRA for the fact that you are doing so illegally according to federal law. And it makes it unlawful to manufacture, import, sell, ship, deliver, possess, transfer, or receive 
an undetectable firearm. And that's why people like, again, if you're the Second Amendment group and you're the right to keep and bear arms group and you're supporting this kind of stuff, you shouldn't be surprised when the bar is set so low for what can be done positively and the bar is set so high for what the opposition, the every towns of the world can actually do. Look, let's go over to T.J. Martinell, and he makes an interesting point that I cited a couple of years ago as well. This is from an article back in 2018. He says, interestingly, the notion that undetectable, I love that he puts that in quotes, undetectable weapons should be banned or restricted led to shooting between Redcoats and Minutemen at Lexington and Concord. This is one of the reasons that there was violence that broke out that led to the war for separation from the empire of Great Britain, Empire of England, that led to the Declaration of Independence. This is part of it, was the idea that guns should never be undetectable to the government. He writes, local militia had amassed arms and munitions, and the British knew these arms could pose a threat if fighting broke out. To remove that possibility and solidify British dominance over the colonists of Massachusetts, General Gage sent a detachment to retrieve, find, destroy these stores of munitions and weapons. Gun grabbers, TJ writes, I love how he puts this, gun grabbers want to restrict undetectable weapons that make it impossible to track who owns what for the same reasons. And his summary, I think, is the best. He says, if we adopted the attitude of the farmer, <laughs> the farmers, if we adopted the attitude of the founders, all guns would be undetectable. That's a stance that all gun rights groups should endorse. They shouldn't be on board with the, uh, the, not only the implementation, but the enforcement of the Undetectable Firearms Act, but also when it came up for renewal, I think it was in 2013 or so, they actually opposed an expansion of it at NRA, but they were okay with a clean renewal for another 10 years. I don't know exactly how that all played out, but there were people trying to expand on that. I wanna say a quick thank you over to Josh for Liberty, who has been repeatedly doing a super chat doing a donation during these live streams. He just, thank you. He says, by inches, my friends. He's citing basically uh, Thomas Jefferson, who told the Reverend Charles Clay in 1790 that the ground of liberty is to be gained by inches and made a donation with that, that comment of 20 bucks. I'm very grateful that, for that. Thank you, Josh. For those of you who are on uh, YouTube, this is a really nice and easy peasy way to make a contribution to support our work. Uh, you just click in Super Chat, and whether it's five bucks or 50 or 5,000, whatever, I'm very grateful for that opportunity. So look up Super Chat for YouTube if you want to pitch in, and thank you, for thank you for that, Josh. So again, back to Jefferson. The ground of liberty is to be gained by inches because it takes time to, even, to convince people what's even good for them. We have to keep pushing forward for what is yet to get. I know I'm murdering that, that uh, quote, but the paraphrase, I think, is pretty straightforward. I want to take a quick look over in the live chat and see if there's any questions that I can answer. Rick Anderson, hello to you. Joshua Akery, oh, he uses printfriendly.com to get past paywalls. I use Bug Me Not a lot, and Wall Street Journal is not included on that as well. Greg McCauley is talking about, earlier on, talking about legislation in Texas to ban enforcement of federal gun control. House Bill 635 is the one that we've put most of our support behind. It is in the House State Affairs Committee, but the State Affairs Chairman has not allowed a single hearing on it yet. You first have to have a hearing, and then you have an executive action where they vote on that. If you want to keep up to date on all the legislation that's happening, make sure to follow us on our blog over at 10thamendmentcenter.com. Of course, you can subscribe to our newsletter at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash register as well. Taking a look and see if there's any other questions that I can get to. Good to see Justin Bayolo, who said he was vacationing in Idaho and Montana. Love it there. Uh, Larry Clark in Kansas. I will probably just go back and read it a little bit later. Clay Kent liked the comment about boot licking clowns. I'm not sure. I'm hoping that maybe there are like 33,000 uh, unregistered, unserialized ones, but I don't know. We'll see. Jane says they will not know where to find the guns made from 3D printers. And I know in previous years when I've talked about this, a lot of gun rights activists are like, but these are junk. They're not good. We, they're unreliable. But you know what? Something new is going to take time. And there are people who are dedicating a lot of time and energy and research and testing to improve on these things. And maybe now they're not as good as a, as a Glock or a Kimber 40 or something like that. But certainly over time, 
what they can become certainly has to be better than this. If they're going to go on and on and on, we shouldn't be surprised when they try to ban anything and everything. And this might be the last resort for people. They have to be able to make their own in a way that's undetectable, even though the federal government says you can't be undetectable. Joey Szymanski says, shall not be infringed sounds pretty clear. It sure does to me as well. But when... You rely, and this isn't directed specifically at you, but a lot of, Joey, but a lot of people in the gun rights community are certainly happy to defer to authority on anything and everything. They're happy to defer to law enforcement lobby groups who tell them that banning uh, enforcement of federal gun control means they can't catch criminals. Well, then we shouldn't ban them from doing that because the cops tell us not to. Or they're happy to defer to the federal court system, and they have different legal jurisdictions and uh, explanations of how this is illegal, but this is okay, and this state can do this, and this one can't. And over time, what happens is it ends up being bad for anyone and everyone in all 50 states. We have to stop relying on government officials to tell us what our Constitution means, and that's kind of a bigger picture thing as well. James does say about the Super Chat that Google does take a percentage. That is correct, but whatever's easiest for you, if you guys want to do Super Chats, of course, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. If you want to do a an annual, uh, an annual membership or a monthly for as little as two bucks a month, that also helps us. We only pay about a two and a half to three percent processing free fee uh, and if you want to use crypto for example we pay basically no and so james would rather donate through the website i appreciate that as well m gabriel's talking about missouri to be missouri militiamen to be created by sb 528 i'm not familiar with that legislation but sb 528 if you can email me on that a team at 10th amendment center.com i want to take a look at that and see if that's something we should be following as well and he also points out, or she, that the Missouri Second Amendment Preservation Act hearing is going to be tomorrow. So in Missouri, there's a two-step process in committee. First, it has to be up for a public hearing where they're going to debate. And then, of course, we're going to hear from the government officials how bad banning federal gun control enforcement is. And then they have a follow-up hearing anywhere from one to three weeks later where they have what's called an executive session and they vote on that. So tomorrow in the Senate General Laws Committee is the first hearing on the Senate side after it's passed out of the House. We can be grateful for the Senate president, I think the term is, uh, Senator Schatz, who has actually assigned it to a relatively friendly committee where the committee chair is on board with the legislation. Uh, in, and done it pretty quickly as well in the process. So we can be grateful for that, but we want to make sure that everyone in Missouri is calling their state senator and telling them, do not water down House Bill 85 because the Missouri Sheriff's Association, and again, if you're not on our email list, go to 10thamendmentcenter.com slash register later today or early this evening. We are going to send an email with multiple bullet points explaining the amendment that the Missouri Sheriff's Association, the lobbying group, this is MSA, is specifically trying to push on the state senators there, and it is really, really bad stuff. Anyways, I'm going on and on at this point. I will continue to read through this a little bit later on and see if I can answer some questions a little bit later. Please continue to leave comments, whether it's live or in the archive. Smash the like button, leave a review on Apple Podcasts or elsewhere. All the mainstream platforms have very easily triggered algorithm. So please consider doing that stuff. It tells the algorithm to show the program to more people. A reminder that Friday's show will probably be bumped to Saturday as well. And of course, if you want to put your financial faith behind our work, pick up a membership card for annual members or just two bucks a month for online memberships as well. That's 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you learned something. I hope you had a great weekend. I really appreciate you spending time with me today, and I'll see you next time here on the path to liberty.